Welcome to another episode of Courageous Me. And I'm super pumped about this one because we've got another fella on, so he's only the second guy we've had on. But can I just say, I met this guy at an event, so afterwards when you're sort of getting around chit-chatting to people, he walks over, and I'm going to be honest, he's a really good-looking, well-dressed guy, walks (laughs) up to me and I'm thinking, oh, this has got to be one of the product providers or the BDMs or something like that. And we got chatting and we got deep really, really quickly and I found out. So this guy is a TEDxUSA speaker and a master leadership hypnotherapist, right? So as soon as this has come out, I'm like, oh, my goodness, we need to talk. So I actually wanted to sit there and talk to him all day. However, respecting that uh, might have been crossing over some boundaries, I thought let's get him on the podcast because I have permission to just ask him as many questions as I want. So I've got Karim Bokta here, and he will tell us a little bit about himself shortly. But Karim, before we learn about the person that you are, can you just tell me what excites you about having a conversation with me about courage? Courage to me, um, and the way that I see it, is what you perceive and how you created that character or perception around courage. So what excites me is that we get to talk about how courage, whether you have a lot or a little bit of courage, and as it sits down in your subconscious brain, how we can get there and change the narrative. Oh, now that's got to be part of the hypnotherapy coming through there, didn't it, the subconscious brain? So, yes. wow. Okay, so I guess this whole conversation is going to be about courage. Just can you tell me a bit about what you do? Because I know when you first told me, I was not expecting it. I didn't know what it was. And I just want to know more. So for all of those listening, can you share a bit about what it is that you do? Sure. So um, I'm a leadership hypnotherapist. So a hypnotherapist specifically for leader, for leaders and their leadership team. Um, What that means is, I mean, People are probably thinking, what the hell is that, right? So if you want to imagine, if you want to have a better team, right? You want to perform better. You want, you know, um, better results. You'd usually get like a HR person or you'd really, or usually get a business consultant in. They talk about the numbers. They talk about all these, super, all these superficial things that may or may not cr- create the change that you want. As we know, um, a lot of all all information and behaviors, behaviors and beliefs, they sit at the unconscious level. Um, and for you to really create real change, you need to get to the subconscious level. So I don't want to bore you with about, you know, what I do because this is about um, courage. Um, but if we really want to talk about courage and we want to understand Look, there's a lot of people out there, especially professionals, who identify as not being very courageous. And the reason why I talk about the subconscious mind is that because there's obviously a belief that once upon a time, you decided that you weren't going to be courageous or that you are this person. And then we go on with life building a, building a character around this identity. And then there are all these emotions attached to that, ident- to that identity. So I want to let everyone know that you don't need to keep reading all these, you know, books about being courageous and attending all these, you know, um, Tony Robbins seminars, walking on coal and all those, you know, types of things for you to get, um, you know, like really courageous because what ends up happening and, and as I know, because I've been through this, you get really pumped after these events or after reading the book. But then two weeks later, it's all the same again. You're in that same type of habit. You're in that same type of pattern because we haven't really got into the subconscious mind and, and figured out and changed the, and we changed the programming. Oh, wow. That is, that is so true from someone who's also, I'm obsessed with all of that. And yeah. you always say to yourself, don't you, at the end of whatever it is, whether you've finished the book or a podcast or you've been to a live event, it's going to be yeah. different this time. It's going to be different yeah. this time. I've learned this stuff. I feel like I'm changed inside. And then, yeah, as you say, two weeks later, you end up 
back doing what you've always done. Okay, so how did you get into this line of work? Because this is not something as a little boy, I'm assuming, you grew up wanting to do. <laughs> definitely not. That, definitely. How that yeah. Happened. Um, I was going through my own um, challenges. So, um, can you share them? Of course, and I'm yeah, and I'm and I'm very open because I really need to let the whole world know because you know I've I've been there. So, how much time do you have? <laughs> We've got an hour, however. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Cool, cool. So, um, I'm a massage therapist. So I got out out of school and I was a massage therapist, and I opened up my own massage therapist in a clinic. Um, I saw these um, pharmaceutical reps walk into the clinic, at the GP center, and I'll and I'll be like, "Oh, this is awesome!" I really didn't want, I didn't really see myself doing massage for the rest of my life. Um, anyway, um, four years later, I've been told no. I got into into a pharmaceutical position, so um, I interviewed very hard for, for three or four years, being told no because I don't because I didn't have a degree and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so finally landed. I won and then worked my way up, uh, was, was there for four years, uh, and then moved on to medical devices. So I ended up, um, being in surgery with doctors, educating them on how to use our products. Um, was there for four years, um, which was pretty cool, pretty cool experience. You know, I would see the doctors, you know, uh, going inside people and, you know, um, all that kind of cool thing. And I wouldn't have been able to get there without really being a surgeon without being a surgeon, but this was the next best thing. Um, and I was around really high performers and I could see what stress and all that kind of thing that they were going through, but no one was really looking after them is what I was sort of gauging. You know, these guys are really high performers, high stress, high anxious, and I was looking after the leaders. Um, I was going through my own stress. Um, so four years later, I, decided that this wasn't for me. It was highly stressful industry and I quit without a job to go to. Fast forward, I um, I opened up a business. So it was a, a restaurant uh, slash cafe. And the same week that we settled in the business was the same week that we had our first child, our firstborn. Now I thought this was going to be okay, you know, like okay, my wife's going to have the baby. She's going to wake up in the middle of the night. She's going to feed them and I'm just going to go to work and come back and it'll be like rainbows and lollipops, you know, and all that type of thing. Um, but it was totally the opposite. It felt like that I had been hit over the head with a baseball bat. So <clears throat> my son had colic and we didn't know. We didn't even know what it was. So he would wake up every 20 to 30 minutes all the time screaming in pain and we didn't know what it was. Um, so I would wake up because my wife was up, you know, I'd want to make sure that she was okay. <clears throat> but what that meant was, is that we were constantly going into, I was constantly going into work on the back foot and slowly, but surely my business started to go downhill. Even though I had finished my MBA at the time and I had opened up many businesses before, I was pretty confident. I ticked all the boxes, right? So if this wasn't a textbook, this business should have been doing well. I ticked all the boxes. I did everything well, did all the strategy, did all the marketing, but it was still going downhill. I was, I honestly felt like the harder that I worked, the more that I started to sink. And I would go home and I would feel like a failure again, because I'd feel like a failure as a dad. I wasn't, a, I wasn't providing for my son. So leading up to this moment, my parents had escaped Egypt from persecution. So my parents made the way here to Australia. And in my head, I was thinking, I want to, I want to do like, I want to do good by them. You know, like I really want to make sure that, you know, that I've also done like, I've, you know, like that I haven't just thrown, thrown my life away in a way. And, you know, I want to be this proud person who's able to provide for their um, grandchildren, but it was, but it looked like that I, that I was a failure. Anything that I had done is going downhill. I had just left a high paid corporate job. What have I done? I felt like a failure as a, as a, as a, as a parent. And I felt like a failure as a, as a husband, I couldn't help my son and I couldn't um, help my wife. 
And then one day um, I was just broken. And then I remember Alex, um, Alex, my wife, she had gone for a walk and I just had some time alone. And I remember just breaking down. Um, she came walking, walking in earlier than what I thought. And she found me curling up into a ball. Um, crying, just feeling stuck, anxious, scared. And she was, she was frightened. You know, the person who always thought, you know, that would be, you know, that always said everything will be okay is now breaking apart. You know, the, the person who, who wanted to protect everyone else and shield everything else can now, she can now see that I'm just broken. And then, um, one day just in my, in my jocks, you know, just sitting on the couch, just feeling sorry for myself. Um, I was watching a Tony Robbins, um, documentary. Uh, so he, it was called, I'm not your guru. And, um, I remember thinking there's something special about this guy. Like he must be doing something right. He's attracting millions of people and he's, he's helping people in such a short time. So I started to research what he studied, um, which was at the time NLP. And I, and I researched, you know, the best schools in Australia for NLP. And then I started to learn. And then I started to learn even more. Like it wasn't just NLP. And I started to learn all these other cool things, including hypnotherapy. And then as I learned and as my racy mind and, you know, my, my anxiety and my, you know, limiting beliefs got better, so did my business. And I'm thinking, what the hell? Like, I, here I am, just finished off my MBA. I had had all these other businesses, but no one taught me this in business school. And, I've, and I had done counseling and therapy in the past, but this, was, this wasn't it. This wasn't that. Very different. It was more results-focused you know, and more of a transformation rather than coping, you know, it, 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 it wasn't just coping, it was a transformation. And then my business uh, started doing well. And then I sold the business. And then I just started learning more and more. And then um, people were asking me questions about business. And I didn't really think that I was going to do this as a business. I just thought this was for my own personal development. And um, People, people were telling me, oh my gosh, Kareem, this other edge that you've got to this, no one's ever told me this before. You really need to do something about this. You really need to start your own business and start helping all these um, struggling business owners who want more but aren't getting the answers. And here I am. Wow. Okay. Oh, fruit. <laughs> where do we go back? Um, so to this moment you've had, and thank you for sharing that because – it's not easy to publicly declare that you were at a space where you actually said you were broken. Yeah. How old were you at the time? Just to give us some context. Um, I think it was just before turned 30, so maybe 28. Oh, okay. Got yeah. it. Got it. Yeah. So when, and you've started, you know, you've seen something on Tony Robbins, seen something on TV, you've decided yeah. to, to study what he's doing in that. What did you notice inside you as you started to learn this stuff? Because a lot of us have done a lot of Tony Robbins' work, read a lot yep. of his books, done NLP, learned it, whatever. But yep. what changed inside you as you were learning all of this? Because not many learn it all and then go on to teach it. A lot of people learn yep. it and apply it to their own lives. Tell me what was going on inside you. How were you feeling? So, yeah, so when I did Tony Robbins, it was good, right? But it wasn't amazing. like. I'm a very high results focused person, right? The reason why I've come up with my own method is because of this thing, because I took really good. So I also did um, Dr. Demartini. And when I did Dr. Demartini, this is when things start to change for me really internally. And what did you do and, with his? So um, I create like, so the Dr. Demartini is a, have you have you heard of Doctor yes, Demartini? I follow him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I was broken because people are like, okay, so I do Tony Robbins, you're right. I do the, or I do NLP, or I do um, hypnotherapy, right? Like they put themselves into a box, 
and because of that they they're really um uh they restrict themselves but i said hang on but this is really good stuff here and there's really good stuff here but i didn't like that stuff there that didn't work for me it didn't work for my clients how can i change it um so when i started doing that and when i learned everything this is when everything started to change for me now my i had originally I, and i didn't even know this but my my mind was really racy so i couldn't think i couldn't like i would jump from things to things right so many times and because it was part of my life i didn't know that this was like that it wasn't like that it wasn't meant to be healthy like this isn't a, like a like a healthy way of being or thinking because i'd been living with this but when i did everything my brain just became so much more quiet i had dramatically decreased my anxiety dramatically decreased my my depression i was able to think i was able to see um things from different perspectives and i was able, and from that i was able to be a really good leader um i was able to carry myself more but most importantly i was able to be vulnerable without feeling scared i was able to tell people how i felt and communicated this perfectly without me needing to feel like i needed to um hold like some armor in front of me like this yeah oh yeah you sorry you probably just saw my facial expression i didn't mean that to disturb no, okay. your train of thinking when you say this I, like it's it's moving so many bits inside me, but you're also a fella. Like I, I I need to acknowledge that one of the things that we hear a lot is how hard it is for men, I mean women as well, but men particularly to be vulnerable and to be able to talk about how they're feeling. And yet you've just said that you got to a point where you felt that you could be vulnerable and you could communicate how you feel. How did that get received? In particular, because you know you're you're operating as a man. Yeah, and not only am I a man, so the people listening to the audio can't see this, but I'm an Arab man, right? <laughs> so in my community, right, uh, I was once known as this, you know, guy who didn't talk about his feelings and all all that kind of thing. You know, I was like, you know, the joke star, the laugh of the party. Um, and all of a sudden, I started to, I started to be vulnerable and talk about my emotions. And everyone, and all the boys would be like, "Are you okay? <laughs> like, what's going on, man? Like, what do you, you want? seem really? Yeah, like you seem very different. Like, um, and they would, and they would, and some of them would be like pretty awkward in front of me. Like, I'm talking about being sad or being talking about, you know, being hurt or you know, and they're like, they don't know how to receive this. They don't know what to do with that information. And then they just shut off then and then they you know they'll turn around slowly and, and want to talk to someone else because they don't know what to say about that and no, people don't um, know what to say whether it's a, a man yeah. or a woman so who's sharing it, this if you know that's being not being an arab man with, in my community let alone being a bloke being a bloke yeah right in general spot on. in general was hard because i had changed my inner world and now my outer world looked looked different too. Like everything, I I perceived everything differently, and I couldn't I couldn't help but just be myself because it was okay to be myself. Oh, but that in itself, being okay to be yourself, is I mean that takes a lot of vulnerability and a bucket load of courage because, as yeah. you say, your inner world has changed, but to everyone else, nothing necessarily has changed in their world. No. So you're still looking like the same guy that they used to hang out with or go to the pub with or, you know, yeah. do stuff with. But now suddenly you are turning up as a different inner person, which they can't see. Mm. And how long, like, I mean, you know, we're talking about this in, in, you know, 10 minutes or something. Yeah. But how long did it take from when you started doing the work till others started to notice the difference and notice this changed identity within you, either just through their interactions or observations. What was that time frame roughly? Maybe about three months. I oh, had felt it immediately. Yeah, because it's a it's a it's a real like it's a. When I explain this to people, they're like, "How?" All right, because because of I've I've done a lot of work, 
on myself in such a small small amount of time, um, the transformation was instant. So I, I wasn't like when I woke up or when I did the work instantly, from that moment, my perception of the world was completely different. So when I started to talk to my friends and they're like, uh, you're weird, but okay, right? And then I'll talk to them more. They'll be like, hey, I've, we've, you know, like um, three months down the track, they've noticed that something was different and they said, hey, what's going on? You know, and then I started to tell them, hey, I've done, I've done this, this and that. I've done some inner work. And there's a, there's a good saying is that first they laugh at you and then they fight you and then they join you. Right, I think that was from Nelson Mandela, and this was what it was like. So in the group chat, you know, they would, you know, make jokes about it and all that kind of thing. You know, I'd be roasted, which was which was fine because I don't, I've got really thick skin, and I would laugh with them. But the funny thing is, was is that a lot of them would start to ask me questions. You know, Karim, uh, can you tell me more about this? And then some of them start to join my program. <laughs> so by this stage you are now creating a business out of it uh no by this no. stage no this is just me saying hey guys you know this is this is who i am type of thing um this is like you know down the line and then after they've laughed at me after they've you know given me crap um now they've joined me so now they're like karim what what are you talking you know i've read this book about change or the subconscious mind or you know all these really cool books what do you think about this now so now i've come to now i've now i've become the go to person for personal development and that really lights up my heart because once upon a time um you know these guys i felt were a little bit stuck and now i've become this person to help them get through to the other side how does that work helping your friend? Like I get it with clients because there's it's a, a professional arrangement. Yeah. How does it work with friends when like because you've known them, right? You've hung out with them, you've you know some of the stuff that's going on in their world. Yeah. How does that work? In a way, it's a good thing because they know everything about me and they and if they can see the change within me, then they'll be like, Oh, I want a piece of that. You know, like it's not fake, it's not like an ad that you see on Facebook or Instagram where this guy's talking and you don't know if it's legitimate, they can legitimately see, uh, see the change within me and vice versa. Mm. If I know them back to front, I know them really well. So it can work as an advantage because they know me and I know them. Um, they just need to allow, like they just needed to allow themselves to be vulnerable enough, um, which because they saw me being vulnerable and they saw me that I didn't blow up or burn, you know, then it gave them courage to do the same. Yeah. Do you know, I always say courage is contagious and yes. it can be contagious from your own perspective. Like if you do one thing that's courageous, it can, and, and you survive it and you come out okay the other end and feel great about it, it can help. But also seeing other people, especially peers in this sense, I guess with them seeing you, seeing you showing up as a very, very different person. Yeah. But how much fuller you seem to be and calm. Like that was one thing I noticed when I met you. There's just this beautiful calmness because I'm quite a little bit, you know, um, <laughs> a little bit excited. Yeah. But there was just, there's a calmness about you and your calmness is contagious too. Like even sitting here talking with you, I, I just <laughs> I feel like a, a natural sense of calm, which is really beautiful because it, that doesn't always necessarily happen. Thank you. So if you were to now knowing that this is the kind of work that you're doing, where did, like, did it take courage to go from um, what you were doing and the work that you had been doing to making this something that you're doing for a living? And you did say that you've developed your own system, which I want to know about too. Right, yeah. But did it take courage to do this or did it just feel like a natural progression for you? I'm getting goosebumps now. Um, well, goody. Because the whole time I felt like I've been guided. So when I, when I, when I like initially went, like I've always grown up thinking that I, like I am more, like there must be more to this planet. Like I'm not just this person. Like, and I've always had this gut feeling, right? 
And it was like the universe was trying to show me and push me out of whatever I was going to do. So it pushed me out of my high paying job, right? It pushed me out of my business to get into this. And when I started doing this work, um, I was scared because um, I was thinking to myself, how am I going to provide? You know, how am I going to pay and, you know, do all these things that the world needs from us, right? Um, but I had this sense of this is my path, that this is my higher purpose in this world because there are a lot of people that are stuck um, and they feel that they're stuck and there's not really much option is, you know, is what I'm saying. But I was doing it while being scared, but I trusted in the process. And I want to let everyone know that it's okay to feel scared by doing it. Like we've all grown up being told, hey, if you're scared, it's okay. Just don't do it, you know, or don't be scared. It's okay, you know, and they, and they want to be, you know, like wrapped up and hugged and all this and all these kinds of things. So when we go in into adulthood and as soon as we feel scared, we go into comfort mode. We go into the things that are um, more natural for us. We go back to where we, to what we know. And because I knew this, I said, okay, well, I'm going to do this while being scared. So literally as like something as simple as typing an email, I'll like, my hands would be shaky. I would, I would feel scared. I would feel, I would feel the fear while doing whatever it is that I had to do. Oh, that is so beautiful. And what is so beautiful as well is that, you knew that, that this is what you were meant to do. And I get this question from people all the time going, but how do you know? Like there's a lot of things that I could do that scare me, but how do you know this was the thing that you're put here to do? Because I know I've had the same epiphany myself and I'm now following very much like almost blindly, but following what's going on inside me that's directing me to do the work that I'm now doing. If I looked even a few years ago to think that I'm here doing this, I wouldn't have seen it. But it feels, in every single cell of my body, it feels right. Yes. What sort of things when people come to you, and I'm sure this even would be clients of yours, how do you help them understand and to trust that feeling or that intuition or that, that thing that's inside them that's pushing them in a direction? How does that come into the practical every day? Sorry, um, you broke up a little bit there. Could you just repeat the question? Is that okay? Yeah. How? Yeah, I did notice we broke up then. How do you help people when they're trying to find what their equivalent is? Like you found your thing, I found my yeah. thing. When people are on this path, what are sort of some of the signs or some of what's going on with them that goes, yeah, this is the path that you're meant to follow? Yes, it's scary, but keep going. What are some of those signs, do you think? So some of the things that I help with some of my clients is that I get to really understand what's so important to them in their life. What I call is that what are the highest values? So as an example, um, I, worked, I worked with a, with a female lawyer and throughout her whole life, she's always been told, you know, I must get a good job. I must have it, you know, because it's a really good status. It, it's really secure and all these types of things. And now she's had her, her, her children, but she doesn't, she feels empty. And she said, Karim, I, I just feel lost. I don't know what to do. And, and, I, and I, and I, and I just asked her a simple question. I said, at the moment, what lights you up the most? What, when you do, what gives you this energy that if you did it all day, you know, that you could do it for free. And she said, Karim, all I love doing is being the best mother to my children. And it was like, in a way that I said, well, why don't you just do that? Why don't you just leave everything and be the best mother to your children? And something inside of her lit up. It was like that she needed permission from me to give her, you know, to tell her that it was okay for you to be the best mum. And that in itself is much more rewarding than, you know, them seeing their mum going into work, feeling drained and, and kids can feel that. How much, how much awesome would it be to have your mum around, you know, being more a part of your life? Like for those children, that is some, so much more rewarding for them in the long run, even in the short term. 
And it's just it's just that simple. What are, What is the thing that's most important to you today that you value, that lights you up, that gives you so much energy that you would do for free? Hmm. And I would do this for free 10 times over. Mm. Mm. I'd do this but, for free. Well, yeah. I am. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, when it lights you up, you could just do it all the time. You know, get into that whole flow state yes. because this is the space that you're meant to be. It's interesting, though. I've spoken to a, quite a number of women, um, especially over the last 12 months, where you know we I do a lot of the work around um, Dimitri's the values factor and, yes. and working from the highest. Yeah, I'm gathering we're on the same page. And they're like, yeah, but... You know, I feel like other people have got these really important jobs or important careers and, you know, there's got to be more, can't there, than just being a mum. And I, when I say just, I'm yes. using their language. Yes. And in a number of cases it's like, but if that right now is the thing that's calling to you loudest and, of course, you're able to do it from a responsibility point of view, then that's okay too and then working through that if this, this could be a person. Now, that might change over time, especially as the kids grow up and no longer necessarily need you. But this is okay. And I know even just some of those aha epiphanies that some people have had mm-hmm. going, oh, okay, so that's okay. It's like, yeah, if that's your thing and you believe this is your purpose right at this time, then great. Let's. What do you need to put in place where you can do that? Now, it might not even yeah. be full-time that that happens, no. yeah. but where that can be the focus without, I guess, the emotional stress that oh I should be there should be something bigger or I should have a bigger purpose than just this like yes. yeah I see you yeah. smiling so I'm sure you've come across very very yeah. similar conversations in your part yeah yeah because people they you know they go onto Instagram they go onto Facebook and they see these lives of the rich and famous you know they're, they're doing you know and I'm putting this in commas they're doing you know amazing incredible things and they're like well I feel like I need to do that Right, which is totally a skewed perception of what reality is. I know, and I know a lot of these. <laughs> I know a lot of these influencers, um, you know, who are apparently you know rich and famous, but deep down they come to me and they're like, "Karim, I feel empty. I wish I was that mum over there." Right? It's just it's it's funny because both of them are looking at each other, thinking, "I wish I was that other person." So That's they build up funny. this, yeah, they build up this life and. And other people would, you know, would say, well, you know, I haven't got my shit together because I don't look like that Instagram person. You know, I don't have, you know, I haven't got the perfect family. I don't have the perfect home, you know, that goes, you know, away on holiday so many times. But then the other person, you know, the person who's rich and famous internally, their, their house may be broken and they feel that they're unfulfilled. Ooh, they're just I like doing- that internally their house may be broken. Yeah. yeah. And what about those like, I mean, obviously there's people that recognise this and do the work. There would be those that recognise this, they try to do the work, nothing changes, so they come and get help, like, for example, the sort of work that you do. What about those where they they recognise there's a problem but they don't realise that there is help? You know, they kind of just think, but this is just the way that I rock and roll. This is just, you know, the cards that I've been dealt yeah. What advice would you got if there are people, say, on the other end of this listening in right now and they fall into that category? Um, well, this is this is what I was talking about earlier, is that they've created this character around this belief that this is them and this is, you know. And um a lot of them like to stay in that in that thing. I don't even know what to call it. They they like to stay in that challenge. Because it benefits in some way. Ooh, tell me more about that. How can it be beneficial if it's not a good thing necessarily? Good, great question. So, as an example, I worked with, um, you know, with a with a client. Uh, it was a female, and um, she said, "Hey, Karim, I really want to get rid of my, um, you know, my over overthinking." Right, she'll just always overthink. It'll take her long to stew on things and all that kind of thing. And then when it when it when it when it came to do what I had to do, and I was speaking to her, her unconscious mind, um, she didn't want to let it go. And so when I asked her, right, while she was in that relaxed state, she said that I'm afraid that if I let this go, then I would then I won't be as close to my husband because she feels 
that when she's in that state of vulnerability, when she's, you know, overthinking and all that kind of thing, her husband asks her, are you okay? You know, um, and, and there's a lot more, there's a lot more connection. So people like to do things because there is an unconscious benefit. There are more benefits than there are drawbacks in their perception. So it's not a nice word, but they like to be the victim. They like to feel like, you know, this way, even though they'll scream and dance to say that this doesn't benefit them, but there are there have been so many times when I've gone out there and I said, hey, let me help you for free. Don't pay me, right? And they'll tell me about their life story and they'll be so proud about, it's sort of like they wear it as a badge of honor. Then when it comes to do the work, they're like, oh, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. And what's so interesting about this is that they don't even realize that they're wearing this victimhood, so to speak, yes. as a badge of honor. They don't realize that. No. No. But and I mean, overthinking is such a common one, right? I mean, <laughs> God, I think. Yeah. You know, Everyone does it. Like, think, and, yeah. and the reason why I know this is because that was me. Right. I was, I was the biggest victim, like poor me, you know, like I had a chip on my shoulder. Um, I tell everyone about my, my childhood, um, growing up, um, about, you know, going to school, being bullied, being vilified for my starter, being put into a, another room, blah, blah, blah. Right. It's the story, right. Didn't have friends, blah, blah, blah. And I'd grow up thinking, oh my gosh, but you don't understand my life. You don't understand what happened to me. You know, it's the story and I totally get it. But what do you want to do now? Like, what do you want? Like, if if I had a magic wand, literally, what do you want? And a lot of people would be stuck because a sometimes they don't know what they want, and two they want to stay in in where they are because in a way it serves them. Mm. And if they're in that place, then I can't. You know, it's it's okay. You mm. you can stay there. You know, um, you know what? Make it. Why don't you make this? this thing worse for you? Why don't you create a worse picture and a, and a worse story for you? Go ahead. Mm. I can't help you. And again, this is not consciously done, right? This is all right. in our subconscious, which is, is why it's so hard. Can I just go back? So you said you were sure. bullied as a kid. Yes. And you stuttered. <laughs> I couldn't speak. So, well, um, and yet you have just done a TEDx presentation in yeah. the United States. Yes. As, but you're a kid who stud can you tell me about that? So when we when our parents landed in 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 from Egypt came to Australia, we we're pretty much homeless. So I saw a lot of things that I probably couldn't, you know, wasn't supposed to see because we were put in we were put in housing commissions. So I would see, you know, like one of the things that I saw was like dead bodies, I'd see needles, I'd see, you know, people beating people up. How old my parents are you? were like mortified because they were probably thinking, what the hell did we just do? You know, we How left. old were you? Um, I was about three or four. Okay, so little. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then, it, like, it came to like it came time to go into primary school. Um, and I had a stutter. I couldn't speak to my teachers, so the teachers thought, okay, well, but the teachers thought, okay, this guy's got a stutter. He, I mean, this guy can't speak English because he just came from Egypt. But I had been there already three or four years. I was, I was already like a Vegemite kid. Like one of my uh -huh. favorite songs was I'm Australian, you know, and, and I could, and I could sing that and, and I was so proud to be Australian, but they didn't even ask me the question of what's, you know, what else is going on? What they did was, is they, they put me into a room, which what, which was what the kids called, you know, um, where the dumb kids go. So this was the ESL room. So they would just put me into another room, but it wasn't that I couldn't speak English. I had a stutter. So I would be in this room thinking no one's really art and like no like understands me. I'm not being heard. I'm not good enough. Um, I didn't have friends, so I was bullied because of my stutter and because I was the only Egyptian, you know, the only brown person in 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 the class. So mum would be um, worried because I would take home kids that are younger with me to play, you know, like on the on the you know like Nintendo. And she would be worried because he doesn't have kids his own age. Mm. So the reason why I bring this up is because from that moment on, I had decided that my, that my world, that my map of the world was going to be unfair, unloving. And it was the reason why I felt all these things again whilst in my business. So it was all connected. 
that I wasn't going to be deserving enough, that I wasn't going to be loving enough. You know, all these things as a parent, when I had my firstborn, it all came back to me and I couldn't connect the dots. I couldn't understand why I was feeling this way. And it all came back to my childhood. Now I've got the goose bubbles. <laughs> yes. So in a way, it was like someone turned on the light inside of me and I could understand and see the mess in the aisles that I've created. Oh, so man. now it was up to me and my, and what I wanted to do now was to clean up the aisles, but not only for me, because now I understand how this affects my son and my other children and their children and their children. So this is, this is a generational thing, right? And, it, and, and I want this to stop with me, that I wasn't going to stand for it anymore. And I took the responsibility and the ownership of saying that this is going to stop with me. And so then I started doing the work. And, and this has all coincided with, you know, the business not working, you're failing as a father, not providing, like, you know, you kind of thought you should have with your wife doing all of that. Yeah. This kind of was the turning point. So do you find that one, having done all the work and now doing the work that you do for others, that you can almost self-heal or do you still, are you still on a learning journey yourself and how do you access the learnings to deal with things that say come up in your life that literally they're in your blind spots or yeah. you know they're not necessarily obvious to you? How do you process that from someone who is so highly self-aware and highly attuned to the point that you do this work? Uh, the growing doesn't stop. <laughs> so it's like whenever I feel I'm at the top of a mountain or the peak of a mountain, I'm at the base of another one. Yeah. It just doesn't stop. So I've got my own mentors, my own coaches, my own, you know, people that I always want to, because I always want better. Because when I, when I'm better internally, my whole, like, it's like the biggest bang for buck. Mm. Right. Mm. If I'm changed internally, my business is better. Mm. My life is more fulfilling. My relationship with my kids and with my family are better. Like everything is just better. So it's like, for me, it's like, what is the thing, thing that I can do that, that can give the biggest change? And in saying that, um, going back to, to the answer of your, of your question, once I started doing this internal work, my stutter started to get better. I was going to ask, actually, at what point did your stutter correct itself? Because you don't stutter now. Yeah. So my started, so I've, in the past, I went to speech therapists, yep. all these kinds of things, but it wasn't really, it was a, like a mechanical problem, mm. but the mechanical problem was coming from beliefs, limiting beliefs. So I could, I could sing, right? I could act at movie scenes and I could do those things without stuttering. Yeah. But when I was singing like someone else, I, I, I didn't stutter. When I was acting like someone else, I didn't stutter. But what was it about me that, that acted, that made me feel crap that I stuttered because I was being me? And that was the whole thing about what was, what was happening inside of me that made me stutter. And I talk about, you know, not only having a, a verbal stutter, but an internal stutter. Where people mm. know what they want in life, they know the next moves. They know, but something inside of them, they they stumble. You know, they hesitate mm. and they can't get to the next level. An internal stutter. I've never heard that. That is so beautiful. And it's right though. Like I can see how this plays out. That when you had the identity of Karim, Karim stuttered. But when you yes. played the identity of the singer or the uh, something else that identity didn't necessarily have the stutter. So that's yeah. why it wasn't. Yeah. How amazing. Because I was, I was being someone else in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, when someone asked me, so then like fast forward, someone asked me, Hey, you know, do you want to be a TEDx speaker? I was still in the middle of, of my growth. I'm like, TEDx, man, I can't even speak to someone, let alone get be on a stage speaking to the whole world. And, um, once I started doing more work, I was like, okay, well, now I'm deserving of this. Now I can, right? It's like all these things, I started to listen to it and I became more courageous because this was no longer my identity. I was able to be the person that I am today by peeling away the layers, by listening to my inner thoughts, 
and not not believing in those things. Wow. So you've gone from being a stutterer to a TEDx speaker and in the United States because you did the inner work. Yeah. You People got rid have been of like, that yeah. inner stutter. You got rid of the mechanical verbal stutter. Yes. And have become a speaker. Like, it's just, just amazing. So, oh, fruit, we seriously need like all day to speak. Yeah. So where does hypnotherapy come into this? Because you can do inner work, can't you, without hypnotherapy or not? You can and you can't. So this is the reason okay. why mm. I use hypnotherapy because as an example, right, um, we spoke about this. So I had weight loss surgery twice. Right, so you have um, to I used... share that weight loss <laughs> surgery twice. <laughs> so I had because of all these things, right, that I had in the past, I used food to numb all these emotions. So I was really overweight, and I had exercised, and I had, you know, tried to, you know, like whenever I would lose five kilos, I'd just put on ten, and people would just be like, "Dude, what's wrong? You know, why don't you just eat healthier? Why don't you just lose weight?" I'd be like, dude, why, you know, like, why didn't I think of that? You know what I mean? And it wasn't what I, what I, re what I realized is what was happening internally. Um, the reason why I was eating, um, that things started to shift for me. So I had my first weight loss surgery. How lost old? Lost weight. Um, I think it would have been about 23. 23. And how much overweight were you? Like, can you I was 140 kilos. Oh, fruit. Okay. Right. <laughs> hey. Okay. I was a good boy. That's right? good. Yeah. And anyone who's, uh doesn't do kilos, what's that in pounds? Uh, is it's it double or half? I think is if it's double, if pounds are double, then it's like 300 pounds. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> I, I think something like this. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Fruit. Okay. A lot. It's big. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Yep. And you're 23. Uh, you're 140 kilos. You 140 have 140 kilos in the past. Didn't really have many, like many girlfriends, you know, um, really hated myself, obviously, the way that I looked, the way that I, you know, all, all blah. All these things, right? Blah, blah, blah. And then I lost the weight um, in, in about two years. So I had I'd become really skinny. <laughs> but my, my fatness, right, or my fat story was starting to override my weight loss surgery, my weight loss surgery. So my unconscious thinking, the, the, the unconscious mind is so powerful. It started to override the surgery. So I started to put the weight back on. And then I had to remove, um, so it was lap band at the time. I had to remove the lap band because it was more dangerous in there than what it was because I was putting on the weight again. And then I had my son. And then I said, I didn't want my son having the same eating habits as me. Um, so then I started to look into other surgeries. And then I had my second surgery, which was the gastric sleeve. And then... Um, it was and fine. How, what did you weigh at this point? Just again, just give us context. Before the sleeve or after the sleeve? Before the sleeve. Oh, at the sleeve. So uh, 130. So I had I'd put the weight back on. So you'd literally put back back to baseline yep. weight. Yep. Yep. yep, yep, Put the weight back on. Yep. Um. Yeah. So then I had the surgery again, and then I had, um, I had I had weight. I had lost the weight again. You know, so it was doing its thing. I had weight, but it was I was what I was considered a slow loser. So it was slow, but, but I had gotten there. A slow loser. What a lovely label. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So then I had, so then I had um, lost the weight, but then afterwards I started to put the weight back on and I'm like, hell no, hell no. Right. This is not happening again. And then I started to be really curious and started to answer, you know, ask some of the questions. This was also part of the journey of why, what was going on inside of me that made me eat. So then I started to have a look. I started to answer, what does food mean to me? When I was, so because we grew up with a lot of scarcity, I had to finish everything off my plate. So I had been programmed to finish everything off my plate and, you know, to create no waste type of thing. Food also meant love because mum loved feeding me and I felt the love when mum was feeding me. So there was an attachment to this emotion of love. So of course I was never going to lose the weight because there were so many powerful emotions connected to this, you know, to this food. Mm -hmm. And no one, no one really, I could, you know, like no one was really putting the two and two together. 
And then, and then when I started doing this work, the weight started coming back off again. Wow. And so how long has it been since you had that surgery, can I ask? Yeah, it's been uh, f- five years. Five years. And can I ask what you weigh now? Because obviously those that can't see 85. you. Oh, fruit. Like that. Yeah. Yeah, massive. And I, and I, and like, and I can get lower. So this is me just not even going to the gym. This is me just, you know, working, you know, um, all that kind of thing. But when yeah. I put my mind to it more, um, you know, and I really put the, you know, put the, the pedal to the mm-hmm. metal. I'll be, I'll be down to like, you know, 75, 78. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah. But for those who can't see you that are literally listening on audio, <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, fruit, you look amazing. Like I would never Thank know you. any of this, like by looking at you. So, oh, fruit. Wow. Okay. So you've realized all of this, you're doing all of this work. Now, what in your experience, and I know I did ask you this question when I met mm-hmm. you, but what do you think is one of the most common challenges that people come to you for help with? Um, well, they come to me asking me, Karim, what's in what's within my blind spot? And then we go down and we understand. And like many, many people's challenges are pretty much the same. Mm. They are scared of being them. They're not used to being them. They don't know how to be them. So there's a lot of fear, right, that's causing them to shut down and do what's most comfortable. But they are torn because they want to do amazing things and do all these great things, but this overwhelming sense of fear because they can't do great things or they're not allowed to do great things or their self-identity says that I am not this person other than what I, what I am at the at this moment. And I literally like want to come across the screen and say, Hey, you know, like you can be whoever the hell you want to be. There's no one else stopping you. And it's like, you've got, and it's like, you've got this magic wand and you can be who we, who you want to be. Like if I believed that I was still this little boy who was scared, who was, you know, bullied, who wasn't deserving of being loved, I couldn't go on and do these incredible things because I believed it. Like you have to be your own champion. Mm. Like you have to really love yourself. Like the one thing that I can ask everyone is that if you were your own child, like what would you, what would you say to your inner child? Yeah. If your inner child was say your son or your daughter, what would you say to them? Mm. And then there's a moment of, oh my gosh, I'll tell Mm. them to go for it. Mm. I will tell them, you know, just to look internally, ask yourself what's, what's going on and just push Push it aside. And a lot of these thoughts or these inner inner self-talk, I ask them, who does it sound like? And at first it's like, oh, it's me. And I'd be like, no, listen to the tone. Listen to the same, you know, who is it? And they'll be like, oh, my gosh, it's my mum. It's my dad. And then there's this light bulb moment because they know that it's not theirs. And they look around the room like think, man, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> like just something simple like that, right? And I say, yes, it's not yours. So go out and do whatever the fuck you want to do because the world is your oyster. You are so amazing. You are so incredible. Go out there because the world needs to hear mm. from you. Mm. And this is what I told them. But, and this is what and I, I guess there's there so many people that don't even realize that, do they? They don't realize that they're actually sabotaging themselves. Yes. By not doing the work. But they don't yeah. realize that's oh yeah. I, I see this all the time. Oh my goodness. And it's and and it's and it's not scary because people think doing the work, like and I always hear this, they they think that hypno so to answer your question again about hypnotherapy, they think that um, you know, it's gonna take them to this dark place where they have to relive an old trauma or whatever it is mm. by doing the work. It's not it's not that at all. It's not that, especially like in my program. So hypnotherapy, the way, the way, why it works is we bypass the critical faculty. What that means in plain English is that we bypass all the bullshit story that you've made. And we're able to speak to your unconscious and able to understand why it's happening or why, or what's going on. And at the same time, we're able to embed um, good things in there. So we're able to clean out all the crap without any, them being any like roadblocks or 
you know, oh, you know, I can't do this or let's not do this now. Um, so that's why hypnotherapy is, is so is so good. Um, but yeah. Mm. And what about to someone, and I, I just had this conversation with someone recently who knows they need to do some of the inner work, but he just said to me, but Kim, I'm just, I'm so scared because I know there's a lot of baggage in my past and I'm scared that if I unlock it, it's mm. like it's going to be like a tsunami and I don't know that I've got the guts or the courage to do that. What would you say to that? Yeah, this is a common question, you know, so back, you know, do the work type of thing at all. Like it already um, makes them assume that you have to go back to every every traumatic moment. So that's why I created the Boktor method. Tell which we, so we go, we don't have to relive any trauma. Mm -hmm. So as an example, if someone's coming to me and say, hey, I've had trauma in the past, I'll be like, okay, well, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. You can, but you don't have to. Um, and I don't want to go back into that event. I'm like, okay, well, we don't do it anyway because my program doesn't really need that. They have a lot of anger or frustration in their life. You know, that person that we, you know, always just, or they've, they're, they're very anxious, you know, or they've got that racy mind. Uh, that's fear right? So that's fear of the future. Um, we go back. So as an, as an example with fear, we go back to the first event of them feeling fear. And that's usually a very like innocent time where maybe like, um, they saw a spider as a, as a four-year-old or a six-year-old or their parents yelled at them. And that's the only thing that we have to have to resolve. I know it's, I know it seems too good to be true. And I know it seems like how the hell does that work? But I'll tell you how in that moment or in that first time you create a meaning to that perception mm -hmm. of that reality. So if someone yells at you, you've created a perception of fear. And in that moment you've created all these other things like, Oh my gosh, I'm not good enough. I'm not, un I'm, I'm not being understood all these types of things. So if we can, erase it from when it's sort of like a, you know, like a Jenga puzzle. If, if we get the bottom of the Jenga and everything else collapses, then that's exactly what it does. So we, we remove the first event or we resolve the first event of fear. And what that does is that it changes the rest of, it, it changes your perception from that moment on from the rest of your life. So in a way we go back in a time machine. Mm. We go back using hypnotherapy. We go back to that first event and we, and we resolve that. And I ask them in, like in real time, Hey, I want you to go back to that. You know, remember that time that you told me that was really traumatic and they'll check, they would go in to see if that is still traumatic. And they say, Oh my gosh, I can see it. But there's a lot of peace in there. There's a lot of love. Mm. There's a lot of calmness in that event. I'm no longer feeling this they've resolved it because they they can now see it from a different point of view. Mm. So this is what I tell them is that they don't have to relive that old trauma. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. And Karim, do you do this with those who have had, you know, something where the first traumatic thing they can think of is seeing a spider, which I reckon I'm one of those, <laughs> or when it, it has been really big trauma, do you work with all people with all sorts of backgrounds and, and all sorts of backgrounds? History? Yeah, so all yep. sorts of backgrounds, no matter how severe they are. Um, earlier in my career, I did a, an ex-cop who, who then had a charity who had CPTSD plus many other, other things. And he said, Karim, you're my last hope. I've been dealing you know, with all these types of things. Um, my birthday is in two weeks and I haven't been able to celebrate it because of my trauma, you know, because of the loud noises. He couldn't be in a room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, and his name's Cleve. And the reason why I can say his name is because we're doing a documentary on it and he's allowed me to, um, to do this. But, um, yeah, now he's thriving. He, I said to Cleve, I'm going to, not only am I going to help you with this, I'm going to help you get your, get your, uh, get your birthday in two weeks. And he said, yeah, he, you know, like he rolled his eyes. He's like, I've, I've heard this before. Um, not only did he have, so I met him the day after. Not only did he have, because he was, he was thinking that he was just going to have like a little, you know, get together, if that, with like a small cake with two or three of his friends. He had a bender. 
Which for someone that couldn't do that because of his trauma, this yeah. is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. This is huge, right? Like for, he's, he's 50 and he's like, dude, I've been able to connect with my friends that I haven't seen in 30 years. Um, now I've, now I've, you've given me my life back. Now I'm able to, you know, have my birthday, you know? And not only that, I like, I haven't stopped partying, you know? Like this is awesome. And he's got a, a really good relationship now with someone else and all these kinds of things. He's, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, but uh, I work with everyone. Um, the reason why I worked with um, with high-performing leaders is because I felt that this was the best way of helping the rest of the world because yeah. people spend most of, their time, most of their lives at work. Mm. So growing up, I used to see my mum come home um, crying because, you know, her boss would usually yell at her and micromanage her and, and I would hate seeing that. So I thought in my head that if I could help the person at the top, the leader, yeah. help them reduce their stress, help them cope better so they don't have to do all these things and then it filters down to the leadership team and then that filters down to the workers, then it filters down to their family. Yeah. But I'm essentially helping with, with, with helping one person, I'm essentially helping hundreds of people. But anyone who comes to me, I I help essentially. But yeah, mm. this is this is what I do. Oh, I love it. Oh, I love it. And I, seriously, we've gone an hour, but I just want to talk to you all day. And the whole thing, the the therapy, like, is, is it a program? Is it how long? Can you just quick overview how it works? If anyone, yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, most of my program is done online um, because I see people from all around the world, all around Australia. It's an eight stage. Um, program. So we deal with the five key emotions that are holding you back. So we put everything that's holding you back into buckets, mm -hmm. anger, sadness, fear, hurt, and guilt. And then we do um, limiting beliefs as well. And then if anything else comes up during that time, then we can do that too. Yep. Um, and it's very, and it's very flexible of how we actually do this. So in, uh, you know, people that want help right away, we can do more of those things more of those stages more regularly hmm. and the people that want to space it out they can do that too so it's a very flexible program but it's all aimed to give you uh 100 results um and to give you what you want and you said at the very beginning of this you're a very very result focused person yes have you never or ever not been able to get someone the results they wanted no I've, uh, this is a hundred percent strike rate um, because I only, because I only work with people as well. Like I'm, I'm very selective. Yeah. I only work with people that want to be helped. Yeah. Once I know this, I know that bo the Boktor method is, is going to blow it out of the park. So I get people that have come to me, you know, saying, Karim, but I've tried this and I've mm. tried that, it, you know, like it hasn't worked. Uh, and I give them the, the peace of mind and saying that if it, if it doesn't work, you know, in the first or fourth, you know, first or second instance, let me continue to work with you until it does or it's your money back. Yep. But I've never had to exercise that because it's always worked all the time. So it's no risk. And what I love even more is one, it's your method. Yes. So it's something that you've brought together through all your years of learning and growing, but also two, you've applied it to your own life because you've had a life where all of these limiting beliefs have been there They've held you back, you've seen it, and you've been able to move past it. And like yeah. I said, you know, just that that incredible story, not only the results you get for others, but even for the results that you're getting in your own life. Like, look how good you are. You've spoken on the stage. You're changing the world. You're following your calling that, that comes from that deep knowing inside who yeah. you are about what you were put on this planet to do. Like you're a walking, talking, living example of what you can then do for other people. So... That's Karim, we'll get, we'll get everyone, we'll pop all the, the links and details into the show notes. But if, mm -hmm. if someone just wants to learn a little bit more about you or follow along, because I, I have been doing that myself, what yeah. is the best place for them to go? Where's the best place for them to go? I'm everywhere. So I'm on LinkedIn, <laughs> I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm everywhere. Yep. But usually people are like, you know, Karim, I just want to chat. Um, but, you know, so I, I what I'll do for um, for the people listening that just want to have a chat is that I'll, uh, is I'll offer a 30 minute free chat with me um, and a free breakthrough to see what's actually holding them back. Yeah. So um, yeah, but I'm, but I'm everywhere. So I'm Karim Boktor, um, 
yeah. So for all the listeners out there who are thinking, oh my gosh, can he, can't he? Um, don't guess and there's no risk. Just t- let's have a chat. I'm more than happy to help you. Um, but yeah. Oh, that is just beautiful. You are certainly one of my most favourite people to have met <laughs> in a long time at a random networking <laughs> event. So thank you. Thank you for coming on. I found this really challenging to limit it to just this hour. because there is so much I'd love to learn more about you. But thank you for your wisdom, for sharing, and for being living proof that really with a bit of courage in your life, you, you can do whatever it is that you want. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kim.